Hey everybody, today is July 19th. This is the KCP community meeting. The uh, I am currently screen sharing the agenda for today. If you'd like to add any items to the agenda, please feel free to go into GitHub and add comments to this issue and we will get started. So Joaquin, uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing so that you can do a little demo. Perfect. Let's see, okay. Should work. So can you read it more or less fine? Yes, looks good to me. Okay. So, I mean, it's a small demo, but it's a kind of important change as it's it's a breaking change. We change how downstream namespaces names are generated. So let me show you right now. I'm in the um, user workspace. I will show you that there is some sync target. Um, let's just see. So let me show you, well, KCP, we have some basic uh, deployment here. Uh, spaces. Okay. So let me show you how it looks on, on the downstream Kubernetes cluster. So let's get the namespaces. As you see here, uh, well, this one is a sinker the we have deployed using the CLI. And those are the uh, now how the namespaces downstream look like. Okay. Before there were longer and they were lacking some information. So there could be some conflicts. Right now, uh, as you see, those are shorter. So external controllers that generate some kind of URL or whatever based on those namespaces, now they have more room to, to play with them. Let me show you the namespace locator, which is an annotation that we put on those namespaces. And it has changed it a little bit too. So as you see here, uh, we serialize this information as JSON inside the annotation. So we know that this namespace comes from the workspace testing, testing, and the namespace upstream in KCP is the full. And the sync target that is synchronizing this uh, comes from this path, has this name, which is uh, the sinker that's uh, synchronizing this namespace and the sync target UID that we can find upstream. Okay, this has been done. Uh, previously, we had only these two uh, fields, and this could uh, cause some conflicts with other ones. So, apart from that, there is something important here which is uh, now we have, we, well, we can add other sinkers. So we can add the same downstream Kubernetes cluster as another sync target. Let me show you quickly. Um, usually cluster one, I will add basically sinker two. And now I will apply the, sinker to, to the same downstream cluster. So now, sorry, oops, yeah, okay, spaces. So now you will see, let me put that here. So now you will see we have two clusters. Um, if I cordon the first cluster, the cluster one, we should see how we get new namespaces synchronized. And this one should be, if we check the namespace locator struct, we will know 
which one it is. Let me show you. So it is the full namespace uh, from the same workspace. So it's the same. It's actually the same works uh, namespace upstream. But as we included more information to create the hash of the downstream namespace, we can have uh, this differentiation. I mean, as you can see, it's the cluster two, but the deployment should be actually the same. This cluster. So we get the synchronous test. This is useful even for developing and for testing things. And well, you can even um, have more, well, several clusters on, on a physical one right now. And that's it for the demo. I mean, it's really simple. Yes, Andy. Thanks, Joachim. Uh, one quick question. Is there a reason that we chose workspace versus path as the two key names there? Could we be consistent? Yeah, that's a good, a good one. Um, not, not exactly. No, there is not a really good reason. I mean, in the concept of sync target, it makes sense that the path of the sync target right now has the same works it's it's the same path as the workspace in this case but it can be it can come from root um from a different workspace yeah so that, it's like the sorry, that, that wasn't my question the, i'm not not asking about the values i'm asking about the key name i know i know i know I, no there is no good reason honestly i mean it made sense that the same target is a resource and the path was the workspace but yeah uh, we can change that to workspace or both, either both to path or both to workspace, honestly. I would change path to workspace, I think. OK. I think we are not super uniform in the APIs elsewhere. I think we have both, so we should check, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. OK, uh, next up is Paul and owner's files. Yeah, so I wanted to let folks know that I opened an issue about using owner's files to try and make sure that we get uh, reviews spread out where we can. And that I'm asking for folks that if you're comfortable in a section of code to let us know, or if you have an opinion on the way owner's files are used, throw it in that issue. Um, but the basic proposal is adopting the same sort of system that we see upstream in Kubernetes um, for reviewers and approvers so that we can spread the love a little bit. Sounds good to me. Um, so what is the concrete ask that people create owner files, put themselves into a reviewer section? I would say... Or do we we want to seed it with some sort of information. So if you are already comfortable in a piece of code, then just leave a comment on this issue. And then maybe we can just go in there and create what we know about right now, and then just leave ongoing maintenance up to the community. Yeah, I think that makes sense. All righty, um, Stefan, time bombs. Yeah, it's just to ask to take a list on that. I'm not sure we have to look on all of them, but maybe it's good to, to pick three or four or something. And just remind ourselves that there is work and everybody is welcome to work on those. So basically those are topics which block GA. And if they are forgotten, they have consequences. So lots of things are security related, not all of them. And yeah, we can just pick some, I don't know. Andy, you want to click on some random one? Um, or how should we do that? 
can also label those which we have looked at, but I think it's good to, to regularly have them here and discuss them. Okay, here's a random one. <laughs> Is this something that you want to go through live right now, Stefan, or is it more just, hey, everybody, these things still exist? Maybe this one is not the best <laughs> uh, example, but there are some which maybe make more sense, like the CO1 blocker, that's GC. GC is open, so if anybody is interested in working on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can get rid of, I think we can get rid of this issue because we already have one for GC. Yeah, if it's time bombed, we are fine. I'll make sure it is. Okay. Are any of these like, um, could we, for some of these, write out what needs to be done and make them good first issues for people to come in and help out with? Or we can certainly improve. I think there are different kinds. There are some which are really hard. There are some which are good issues. Yeah. First issues. I was just wondering, I don't know how many good first issues we have at the moment um, where yeah. we have written out like what. So, for yeah, example, like the steps sync service accounts, config map secrets. That's another one which is important. We are, we are ignoring that for quite some time. Like we sync everything, every secret is synced down to the P cluster, whether it's used or not. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think the, yeah. the call here is if folks have bandwidth and want to look into these, please do. Um, and these will obviously be worked on before we hit 1.0. Um, but, you know, we we have stuff slated for 0 0.7, or if it's, if we need to bump things around, we can. Um, but I don't think that we can expect that we're all just going to rally on all of these right now. Oh, no, this is, it's not meant. Um, it just, I think we're not aware of everything in this list. And maybe it's a good input for planning next time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, basically all of the stuff that's in TBD, in addition to the time bombs, if they're not here. But I mean, we have 138 issues that were opened at some point. We decided, yes, we eventually need to get around to them, but we haven't. So like anything that's in the TBD milestone is a candidate for inclusion in future milestones. But those are not blockers, most no. of those. No. That's my claim. Everything in Time Bomb is a blocker for GA. OK. I'm going to stop sharing. And we'll go on to Lukash for a sharding demo. OK, I'm next. Uh... All right, so I'd like to you know, share with you something I've been working on quite recently. And essentially what I want to show you is how working with or even you know, creating a cluster workspace against multi-shard environment could look like. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And you should see my terminal. Is that okay? Is that correct? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. So I'm going to use this binary to create my environment. So essentially, it will create the root shard, an additional shard I call shard1, and the proxy. So let me run the command. Now it's creating the root shard. So hopefully it won't take long.
Now it's creating the shard one. So I gave it two additional flags. One is a shard name just to identify the shard. And the second one is a path to kubeconfig that points to the root shard. So I use it for various things. For example, I use it to register the new shard in inside the root, uh, the root shard. So it looks like our environment is ready. So let's log into the root shard. Into root workspace and let's list shards. And as you can see, I've got two shards, the root one and shard one. And now I'm going to create uh, a cluster workspace in the root shard, but I will schedule uh, it onto shard one. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, cluster workspace will be hosted by the root shard, but the content of that workspace, like namespaces, secrets, will be hosted on the shard one. So let me show you the manifest. So we are going to create uh, example cluster workspace. And this is how we are going to schedule that workspace on shard one. Uh, and let me just show you current workspaces before I do that. There's only one. And as you can see, our uh, new workspace has been created. It's ready and it's on shard one. So now we can try to create something inside that workspace. So I will log into shard one into our new workspace and I will create a namespace. So currently there are no namespaces. Let's just create one and try to get it. And as you can see, it worked. At the same time, uh, accessing namespaces from that name, uh, sorry, rogue space from within the root shard is not permitted. Uh, so if you would like to, you know, learn more about the details, you can check out this PR. Um, it's kind of a messy, but uh, give us, you know, a starting point and helps us identify all the places that need to be aware of multiple shards. So, so for example, right now, what we do is we simply pass an additional informer. So for instance, I had to change uh, the authorizers. So they will try to uh, find the given workspace in the root shard if the local shard does not contain uh, the given workspace. And uh, perhaps this is something we will have to do to all existing controllers and all new controllers until we have something more proper. Like, for example, in the future, we could you know, change informers to be aware of multiple shards and provide uniform interface to, to end clients. And uh, that's all I have for you today. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Lukash. That was really cool. Um, I am looking forward to, you know, where we go with that beyond Thanks. just two shards. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so before I move on to doing issue triage, does anybody have any other topics of any kind? that you would like to discuss. I'll just put a reminder out there from planning that we hope to talk about the design topics in next week's community call and the following community call. And those are topics that we expect to work in 0.8 so we can give a little bit more feedback on there. So hopefully folks are having their design discussions this week and are, will be ready to present 
next week and the week after. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I know that I've been invited to a couple that folks have scheduled and uh, hopefully others are as well. All right, um, I'm gonna start doing issue triage. We've got 11 and uh, if, if you all come up with new topics that you wanna discuss, please feel free to um, raise your hand in uh, Meet and we can go to those. So first up was a flake around permission claims. I know Sean, you had an idea for how to fix this with the controller. Um, do, I'm, do we know it? It's still there. I'm not sure. Is, it, I think it's the case of the yeah of wonder, the event handlers being lost. Yeah, I was just gonna say if when I looked through the logs, it looked like it literally didn't get called. Yeah. To yeah. label things, and so like we weren't labeling it, and that's why you failed the test. I think the addition of the handlers or the re-adding of the handlers probably fixed it with the, because it is managed by the dynamic informer, I think, right? So. Okay. Um, yeah, we can reopen it if we see it again. Yeah. Um, it's, on more that... it's more clear now because of, but, so I did make a change to this test that did wait for some stuff to make sure that it didn't flake in another way. But then okay. I think this flake was because of the D D SIF. So I think, Hopefully this doesn't flake as much anymore. Okay. Um, on the topic of like, have we seen tests flake recently? I know Kubernetes has the fancy web UI where you can look at tests. I, I know there's test grid and then there was the other one whose name I'm forgetting. Transport. Yeah, like do we have access to that or would we have to get added? You can think about it and we'll, we'll talk about it offline. <laughs> um, That's the stuff that never got open sourced. I can't remember exactly how it's plumbed in. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like a big data thing. Um, all right, uh, I have not looked at this before. Um, Stefan, I think you had talked with Matush about this a little bit, right? Or am I? Not read option to not use simple. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's something he wanted to uh, um, to add, like an experimental flag for development purposes. So and you to PR, so I haven't seen it yet. Maybe. Okay, I'm just going to put coming. TBD on it because yeah. it's not uh, coming in zero seven. Um, to use a cluster workspace type, the user needs to have access permissions in workspaces where that type exists. Uh... Yeah, this is a, it's a hole in our story at the moment. So we need a solution for that. Um, briefly in Slack, we talked about maybe those export concepts, like mm -hmm. what should, drives the catalog might solve that. Would so that, that help basically with, with the cluster workspace type? Yeah, it's the same thing. Like if you could, could publish, if you were able to publish something in the in the root workspace in the central place, mm, okay. where you can place um, airbag rules, Got it. then maybe it's fixed. All right. Um, this. Okay. And for the moment, of course, owners of those workspaces have to open them up, at least for access. I mean, people cannot do anything, but they can they can at least get discovery or something like that. It's just a question of traversing a number of workspaces to finally somehow go to the run that con contains the right uh, formation also. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in some cases, at least. It's... Okay, here's a request about ready checks. Yes, Ar Argo CD is checking slash ready set. And the URL we have is slash cluster something, so we don't have ready set under that. And ah. So if we could just redirect those to the, the main ready set, would 
swap site. Okay. Uh, yeah, we should be able to put a filter in somewhere in the handler chain. Yeah. Uh, and this could be a good first issue, maybe. All right. Well, well, I don't know. I don't know that this is really a good first issue. <laughs> it's um, it, it depends on the interest of the person doing that. Yeah, so I mean, you have to know how the handlers are working, and yeah. But at least it's yep. quite a very narrow scoped issue. I mean, yes. it doesn't touch many parts of of KCP. So it's hack wanted. It's not good for first issue. Yeah. Um, soft finalizers. What is a soft finalizer? That doesn't ring a bell. It's your in here. Sorry. What is? What do you is know a what soft finalizer is? Scope finalizer are the ones, the soft finalizer, I guess, no? the one that you can set by cluster. It's the one but, with the annotation. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's not a real Kubernetes finalizer. It's set via an annotation. Yeah, I've heard this, um, this issue. Basically, so sorry. No, 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 go, go on, sorry. So basically, if I remember correctly, um, they wanted to, okay. So right now the soft finalizers are set by resource. So you have a resource and you can decide. So an external coordination controller can block the deletion of that resource. Um, well, that's it. It can block until that uh, resource wants to um, has to do something, a failover, whatever, and then remove the sub finalizer, and things uh, keep going. No, so it gets actually removed. The issue is that in some cases, uh, for example, the global ingress controller will monitor a namespace for ingresses, but and they will add a soft finalizer to the ingress. But that's actually not useful if the deployment and the services and everything in the namespace is gone. So they will need to add the soft finalizer to all the resources in the namespace. So instead of being a soft finalizer per resource, they want to have a uh, soft finalizer at the namespace level that gets copied into the resources. So they don't need to look for all the types and everything inside the namespace. Uh, so technically, what would be better is if there's a way to have a finalizer that describes the workload, but given there's nothing like that right now, namespaces are the best way to describe the whole workload. I mean, given that this is a request for new work, like a new feature, would it make sense to try and do something like that, Hiram? Like design for more than just at the namespace level? So if you want existing uh, cube apps to just work using HCG, right then like how do you guys designate you know designate a workload it seems like you guys are using namespace to designate a workload right now so that's why we're saying this uh, i mean I, I would say that so namespace is a level of granularity that uh, applies to placement and scheduling but it it doesn't have to be a firm boundary to define a workload if somebody decided to span namespaces 
Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying it's the default one. Like if you take a existing cube app and you deploy it to KCP, it seems like many spaces like how you group that workload right now without any extra resources yeah. presentations. Yeah. Maybe it's because if putting everything related to a workload inside a namespace, you don't need to explicitly define the relationships between the objects that constitutes this workload. Right. right. So uh, until we have a design that correctly defines those relationships, we can put everything into, into a namespace. Yeah. And the only this reason I bring that up is because in the future, maybe you guys do design this, and it's an optional thing that does exist, and then we'd rather use that instead, right? Yep. OK. Uh, well, as usual, TBD on this. Uh, and then, yeah, Joachim or um, Phil, if one of y'all can come back and add some more details, uh, even just a pointer in the code to what the annotation is, that'd be helpful. All right. Um, Stefan, you filed this security issue. Yeah, basically, the question was, do we have to sync network policies? And we quickly came up with this example that basically, today, a workload which is synced has full network access on the P cluster, which means you can port scan and whatever look for, for exploits on that cluster. So the idea was that we might want to have default network policies, which basically stop workloads from accessing anything outside of the workspace, like outside of the namespaces which belong to the same workspace. Right. And in addition, we can also support network policies defined by the user, but this is like an add-on to default policies. So I think we need some action items here. Um, I mean, I, I think the the title we might want to tweak a little bit, uh, or maybe we turn this into an epic or a mini epic in terms of network policy security. Yeah. Like, do we need an action item to create a default network policy? Do we need to make sure that the syncer is configured by default to sync them? That sort of thing. So. Um, if somebody wants to come back in and uh, and update this or add comments for concrete action items, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Next up is ah yes, adding known internal types to internal schemas for the virtual workspace to use. And um, I had some conversation with Sean in Slack, I think yesterday about this, where we have a package level shared exported variable that lists the types that we want all virtual workspaces to potentially have access to. Um, and these are internal types. So config maps, namespaces, secrets, and service accounts, I think, are the four that are available. And that makes sense for the sinker virtual workspace. But for the API export virtual workspace, we're um, potentially going to want to add more, like um, our back resources. So, um, and Sean had had put this in as well. I think this uh, this is the sort of thing we probably would want to put into zero seven as part of the um, ongoing work for uh, permission claims. Any objections, Stefan, or anybody to zero seven on this? If we find somebody who wants to work on that, sure. Uh, Sean, was that something you had time to take on, or were you thinking? Or I think Robin was maybe interested in helping out there. Yeah, I think Robin mentioned that she, that they would be willing to take it. Um, yeah.
right. Um, I'm going to put it in seven for now. You can always bump it. And I'm happy to work with Robin or whoever on um, what, to, what to do here. OK. Yeah, it's kind of hoping that my, me capturing the outcome, if we could agree on that, then I could also help out. OK, maybe. cool. Thanks. Yep. All right, so here's one where we have a type that is extending universal and apparently the initializer isn't getting cleared. I haven't looked at this. Um, I think we probably need some logs or need to try and reproduce it. Sounds like a bug. We certainly have an end-to-end -end test that has multiple inherited initializers all getting deleted. So yeah, we, I think we might need to in, improve our bug um, yeah. template to add logs. I ask for logs on this. Yeah. All right. Um, I think, Steve, could it be that the bootstrap controller only looks on the type and not the initializers? I would guess, because this predates initializers. Sorry, what's this? The universal uh, bootstrap controller. It predates initializer, so it will just look on the type, and the type is not universal, so it will not do anything. Could be, just a guess. Oh yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, if it's if it's still using that old bootstrap code, then then it has to be migrated. Okay, um, I put TBD on this, although. I don't know. I feel like we probably need to fix this sooner rather than later. So I'm actually going to put it in seven. Uh, no way to get the owner creator of a home workspace as we clean the annotation. Um, Stefan and I had talked yesterday about possibly storing a hash of the workspace creator as an annotation on the workspace so that you could do at least do a comparison against a username and the hash of it against the annotation. Uh, we were trying to avoid storing PII if possible. Yes. So in one of my open PRs, I re-add username, just username, no group, no UID. And it's only mm. on cluster workspaces. It's not visible on workspaces which means it's as secure as whole bindings, for example. Mm -hmm. So we don't expose that mm -hmm. to anybody. Do we, I guess in general, want to support like this entire access pattern? Oh, this right like, here? Yeah, like it doesn't matter which identity is being used to create the call, we're using somebody else's. This is a, a temporary thing. Okay. What is okay? But we need a some kind of owner concept. At least when we talk about sharing, we will come to that. Yeah, long term yeah. we'll have quota. Like we'll have aggregated, distributed, rolled up quota. And if in a workspace and all of its descendants, you literally want to allow one API binding to some export, then you hopefully can do that with the distributed quota that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, I, I think the home workspace is, is quite a, a specific thing in the sense that um, in its inherent meaning, it's it's attached to, to a user. It's not just a, a resource that can be, you know, 
for which permissions can be uh, given to anyone. Uh, but you know, it has been created by a user and it's dedicated to be really personal to this user. So maybe right, like, this is- what, what do we need to record the owner for there that we wouldn't be able to just do with our back? To avoid, yeah, I, to avoid sorry. conflicts to be secure in that case. Do you have an example? There, are, there might be other users which have special characters and we map them to something like Dash or so. So there might be multiple users mapping to the same home workspace. It's uncommon, but it could happen. And we use that owner annotation to know which user it actually was. But for all of that, um, so all you're, of wait, that there's, we don't have a deterministic, like unique mapping between owner and workspace? Yes. We okay. don't. Well, it's deterministic, but it's not. Uh, and there's no way to so you might. It, I'm kind of confused. It, on how it's, that... it's, it's a hash. It's a, a SHA uh, 256 hash of the user, of the complete username, unmongled username. So, so I mean, but this is the, 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 the bucket. Yeah, the bucket. Yes. So the, the the full path is is uh, based on hash of the unmongled username. So the probability that you um, that the full path of the homework space is different is is but very it's not, low. It's not zero. It's it's there. So that's why we use the user. We it's could get rid of the user. We, we could hash it because look up. For lookup, we, we can just use hashes, that's enough. But yeah. we have at the moment use cases where we need an owner and we will need the owner for sharing eventually. And why do so, we need it for sharing? Um, because there is an owner concept in sharing, at least if we follow what other platforms do. Right, but like, it's, what does that inform? Because like, for instance, if, if only the user can share, that is also sufficiently implemented with only that. It's not what we, yeah, it's not what we decide now or design now. It's not designed, it's not sketch, sketched out. We will come to that. And we might rethink this topic as well. Yeah, to be clear, uh, at, at the beginning, uh, before the, the, the peer that um, Stephanie was speaking just before, the two days peer, um, the owner was mainly important so that in any case we have the information of what what is the user that requests the creation of this homework space to correctly calculate uh, the buckets also to correctly set up the airbag rules that gives the user access to his homework space so that was mainly at bootstrapping and automatic creation of the workspace that and the various steps of it that you needed to at least temporarily store the uh, owner also for your initializing uh, uh, work, you know, uh, the initializer uh, virtual workspace. But it seems that in the case also of the user sign up flow, um, they also needed uh, this owner information, I mean, later on. But since we didn't want to leak the whole owner struct, then uh, that's the meaning of the last peer of today. Just keeping the minimal user information for. I guess. I'm thinking if we need a design where there is a strong one-to-one -one relationship, maybe the buckets need to be structured in a way that we don't need further data to figure that out. Like that seems. But uh, this is just one small example. Um, workspaces also need that maybe. So I would not over-design something until we see the full story. And we should come to that. I mean, it's not far yeah. away. All right. So I'm, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause this. Yeah. We can talk about this offline. So one idea is storing the hash. What was the other one that you said you had either done in a PR or were about to do in a PR? I, I just open up the username alone. So that's the easiest thing. Just username is there, no groups. As an and we can revisit, yes. Or okay. And if we're picking this up for 07, maybe we should jot down like what is it actually that we're trying to do here instead of hypothetical maybes but, uh, and temporary uh, things. It, it, it's not a problem we will solve in zero seven. So we will come to that. Like the sharing topic will come, and then we will work on that seriously. Now it's just a temporary thing. We can rename it to experimental if we are we feel okay. safer about that. Okay. Um, I quickly triage what was left, so that's done. Um, 
milestone epics for zero seven. I don't know. I mean, given that we're just starting design, I don't know that we need to go through these, but um, here's what we have on the list for right now. So if you have any interest in any of these areas and you have some spare cycles to help out, please take a look. Also, um, we do have the work packages document um, where we have candidate themes and explorations for 07. So um, I'll paste this into chat as well if uh, y'all are interested in helping out. We'd love to have more, uh, more folks involved. All right. Um, it's 48 minutes past the hour. I don't see any additional topics here. Anybody have any last minute things you want to chat about or shall we take a break? All right. Thanks everybody for the discussion today. We will see you next time. Have a good rest of your day. See you. See you. Thank you.